Okay, so the, the, I had a quick look at um, you behind this. I had a look at Julian's video of you on the first run down. And I want to address two things with some accelerated learning. One will be the fact that the ski has a length to it. So we're going to be tackling four and a half balance. And the second thing is quite complicated. We're going to be tackling the pelvis in the midsection of the body and talking about how skiing is a sport and it requires us to have a lot of torque and tension that I will show you on the video is completely absent in your skiing. So there's two things we're looking at. The first obvious thing as well is there's a timing issue with your releasing of the curve. Now, a lot of instructors spend a lot of time teaching the end of a curve, you know, what you do after the fall line, because it's actually quite easy to teach the end of a curve. But actually, the initiation phase of a curve is quite complicated. And basing this upon what I would call the tunnel concept is the idea of how you finish one curve will basically set you up to start the next curve. And there's an issue with everybody's finish of that turn which is kicking them into that timing being all out of sync. The first thing I want you to do, we're just gonna head down to a flatter section of the trees, but what I want you to concentrate all of you is your perception of what I mean by torque and tension. We can create torque and tension in our own bodies, but it's difficult for us sometimes to understand what that means when somebody says core stability or, or core tension. There are 10 muscles that make me be able to lift my leg up and down. 13 muscles allow me to externally rotate in my femur, into the hip socket. We need to engage and understand if they are active, particularly in the back of our body, or are we actually just allowing gravity and forces to make us ski? So what might help us get more torque and tension when we ski down? Your job now is to play with that on the way down and try to experiment with what that could possibly mean particularly between the end and the start of the turn. How do I create tension? What is your method? He asked the question before Julian got here, but basically we all agreed that that run, that shorter run, was much more tiring than that long run we did from start to finish because we were obviously having more tension. Now, Mike asked a really good question and said, well, how do we know if the tiredness we're getting is correct? Because obviously we could see it as inefficiency, the tiredness, or we can see it as efficiency in the fact that we're more dynamic now in our skiing. So if you ever see a racer at the end of that 90 second run, whatever it is, he isn't sitting there talking to the camera, having a chat, he's blowing out his backside and dying because obviously he's skiing with tremendous power. Now don't get me wrong, if you go off and ski with a group of recreational skiers or your parents or something, and you're just sauntering along, you could probably saunter like that all day. But what made you a lot more tired was the lower position. And as I said, as soon as we did that, we automatically put the muscles and started to contract certain muscles, which made you tired. And because I had you focused on not going too tall, it meant everybody was more dynamically low. And that dynamic lowness should have felt more tension, more grip in one sense as well. Now I said there was two folds to this. And the other fold was, I need you to understand because you're in a lower position for longer, some of you might have felt you got kicked to the tail of the ski a bit. Did anyone have a sensation that in lower position, sometimes the ski was getting ahead of them? Yeah, at one point I did, yeah. Okay. It, it can happen because you're in a lower position. And if you don't know how to handle the length of the ski, it will happen. So I want to quickly tackle some of the most important part of skiing, which is fore and aft. And to do that, we're going to do a pole drill where we're going to make a short turn down here but we're gonna do it with no speed. Now it's the hardest thing in the world to do because speed for skiers is a friend to us as is the incline of the hill. Here it's very flat. 
And the natural thing you'll want to do is give yourself a little push off to make a little short turn, but you're not allowed to do that. You've got to literally go one, two meters and then start making a short turn that happens with no stemming. It doesn't have you tripping over and it doesn't see you just building speed. You're going to be doing it completely from null, from no speed. Okay. So the drill is this. And once you see the idea of it, I just want you to have a try of it. You don't have to do this one by one. It's not ski school. So you can just do this spread out a little bit and have a try. But all I want you to do is to point into the fall line here, and then you're going to make a short turn. And you'll notice there's no stemming, there's no type of tripping over, and there's no speed. Can you do that? Have a go until you reach me another 20, 30 meters, and just see if you can actually do that. Remember, no cheating, no speed. Could see how difficult this was and as I was explaining off camera to me this is the difference between the expert and the good skier the good skier knows to stay in the middle of the platform the skis are a moving platform so therefore we need to move with the skis the expert skier breaks that rule because he knows just like the walking gait or you're gonna jump or you are gonna run in normal tennis shoes training shoes you need to go to the balls of your feet to the middle of your feet and often onto the back of the heel of the foot to be able to move correctly when you're in normal shoes and there's the secret the same applies on skis because I need to use the length of the ski and therefore I need to be able to have my weight transfer more forward and middle and more back at times however it has to be done with tension because the ankle joint is king here about five of you don't have any access to your ankle at the minute okay there's a couple of you who could do it rick was okay at it pretty good example of it because he can use his ankle and he was able to pull and push his feet whereas some of you interpreted it as a jump is me doing that whereas actually the jumping action is because of the rapid pull of the ski it's not because i'm physically doing that it's because the skis are being pulled and pushed so quick the tail is released if the tail releases in other words the tail's not gripping what does that allow the ski to do when the tail's not gripping turn so girls where you found it difficult was because you were sitting middle and if you sit middle, what happens is that, and then you go that with your hip. So there was about five of you doing this, and you'll see it on camera, because there's an angular momentum. There's this huge generation of force when we twist to steer. So whereas Rick got his skis unweighted, which meant when he twisted, the ski did that, some of you didn't get the ski unweighted. So when you twisted, the ski didn't do that your body did that instead and then the ski follows afterwards but it's a delay that means it's erratic and now you have this thing going on unfortunately it's one of those things you've got to practice and this is something you can just all practice all it is is learning to go fore and aft and the timing of the fore and aft shouldn't be that difficult when do you think i want to be heavy forwards yeah, to try and get that tail unweighted so I can steer across. And towards the apex and the end of the turn, I want to be heel heavy. Why do I want to be back here, do you think, and not just stuck forward? Yes, it's the yin yang. It's like opposite. It's always happening. If you just stick forward, you'll, you'll find it just as difficult. You've got to unfortunately be pendulum between fore and aft. And it's this key to skiing. It'll help if you're more dynamic and you've got more tension again. Okay, so, no cheating. Rick, go off and do your little demo again, but try not to put any speed into it. Okay, so we just watch Rick go off. He's making a nice pole plant as well, which is helping him. Okay, so turn. Okay, 
You see his ankles? Ankle tension. His tails are up. See them? But it's not forced. So some of you are forcing the tail release. Force it. It'll throw your body out of line. Okay, so you just need to be calm with it, but you have to be active. So it's going to be frustrating for some of you. Very frustrating because it's, it's not easy that. It takes time. Practice all the way down to the canton. Anywhere where you want. And I'll just mill around and try to give some help. But I'm telling you now, talk and tension. Squeeze the poles. Imagine it's my neck. Like that'll help give you something up here. You need something to turn against. And if you're floppy, you can't turn against the lower and upper parts of your body. Think of wringing a cloth out. You grab like this and you turn them against each other. You need tension between the two things and you need to be in the right position, okay? Have a go anywhere you want. Most obvious place where this type of movement happens in ski fundamentals, in, in, in skiing terrain. Which of the skill sets do you think requires a lot of this? Moguls, yeah. This is why maybe you can't ski moguls. Because if you don't have this action, moguls become very, very challenging because you're basically stuck in the middle of the ski and you try and you always end up backseated or the skis pop out. So this action has to happen very fast. And in a longer turn, do you think this action's there or not? Yes. yes. Well, not that it's not there as much, but it's exactly, yeah? The impulse changes in the long term, that's all. But it's still there. And I'll explain why. Now, a lot of people can't seem to activate these muscles around here, these 13 muscles that I was talking about. So a lot of you are getting caught still with this issue. So I, I'm just picking on you first. And I just want you to put the hip circle around your thighs. Now we use gym bands and this one's a bit more advanced for squatting, etc. It's really to help people activate, to activate their glutes. That's why I'm using normally a hip circle. Understand tension. Unfortunately, I don't have eight hip circles here. Put it back, maybe just above the knees, a little bit higher there. Now, from this position here, for example, can you feel if you drop lower down that that's pulling your knees in? Okay, that's having an action of pulling the knees inwards. So you're having to force the knees outwards to counteract that pulling. And that's basically activation. We've got torque. She feels it because she's forced to push against the band because the band's pulling in. And this brings us on to an interesting thing where you see people A-framing in their carving turns like this, and the ski instructor might do a drill like this. This is the wrong drill. This actually is counterintuitive because I'm switching off the muscles that I should be training. I should actually have the hand on the outside and be training my muscles to actually activate. This would be deactivation of the muscle. Yes, it would put me into a more parallel position, but I'm not training the brain correctly. So here where the band's on the outside, I'm hoping that this will help activation. Be aware, this. Are you doing this? Or are you able to activate those 13 muscles I talked about and start to turn your feet? Remember, we can't turn our feet if the ski edge is hard into the ground at the back. It doesn't happen. I have to unweight this to allow oversteer of the tail. That's why you're getting caught. Okay, we'll practice one more time to the flat. Job done. Very good, Ricky. That's better. Try not to be too snappy with a turn. Be a little slower. You're going too quick, you're cheating. That's it, good Will. Try and go slower again if you can, then keep going, but go slow as you're possibly, almost stopping. There you go Oliver, that's it. Push forward, that's it.
so what we've identified is some of our strengths and weaknesses within doing something like this. And as I was saying, it's not something that's gonna happen quickly. This is the type of thing that needs practiced a lot because I've just told you it's the difference between good and expert. And if it was just a matter of doing 300 meters and going, oh, we're all experts now, it would be a, an easy sport and it's not. It takes a long time to get this sensation of fore and aft in the ski and understanding it. And it's such an important concept that I will show you in ski analysis later this afternoon. But some of you actually are already making changes, um, particularly here when we saw your binding pop off was a good example of how much more force and pressure that was brought to the front of the ski and on the heel that the binding clipped unclipped. And this is one of the reasons why we have different settings for bindings for experts, beginners and intermediates. And it's because you're going with that technique into the expert field, the binding needs to be far more clamping in. Otherwise it will just pop and release. And this is because, as I said, you were definitely pitching and getting forward much more. We're gonna go back to a long turn and maybe bring it into a funnel turn where we'll go from long to short, but we're not gonna forget two things, the lowness and this pulling and pushing, even though it's a long turn. I don't want you to forget it's still present. As Rick said, it's still there, but the impulse will not be so dramatic. So Oliver, you were, uh, no, it wasn't, it was, I think you were a bit snappy, so you weren't really going like that. It, it doesn't really happen like that. It's not like a, a jerky impulse into the ski. Even at the fast speed here on a short turn, it still needs to be a smooth transition from the rear to the tip, okay? And that's what I want here, a smooth transition. Yeah, any questions, anyone lost? There comes a point in the lesson when you're, when you're teaching that, you've got to decide sort of which direction we're going with this. Now, we can't, we could spend the next two weeks doing four and a half balance and it wouldn't be time wasted. Um, it's that important. However, I already said, this is a bit of an acceleration where this is not a private lesson. I'm not with one person. And when you guys teach and you're with one person, I could look at um, Will and just go, right, Will's strengths are this, Will's weaknesses are this, and now concentrate on that. However, we've got another seven people on top of Will. So now I need to think, I want to try and engage everybody and sort of sprinkle something across and hopefully if people are paying attention some part of this means something to them and the next bit's quite difficult because i'm going to talk about retraction and when we're skiing the turn i've already asked you to be a lot lower in the turn and strangely enough it's as we're coming round the turn here, I actually want you to go against the thoughts in your brain. And at this point here, I want you to go more to the rear feel and more lower, not go up and to the front. I want you to actively retract and feel that the up action is a byproduct of you moving back it sort of springs you a little bit up and it allows the skis to move away from your center of mass. The key to good skiing is to get my skis away from my center of mass. The more my legs are away from my center of mass, you would argue I look more dynamic and a better skier. If my legs are close to my center of mass like this. This is just me sitting back, okay? So to get that conception, I need retraction. And retraction's not the same as compression where I see people sort of flop down a bit. I want you to actively feel you're grabbing and pulling yourself down as you reach here. And I want you to feel that active pull down to initiate the turn, not what you're told to do, which is to go up and forward. I want you to instead pull down and let the up and forward be a byproduct. So what do I mean by pull down? Well, if I take hold of you under the armpits here and you see as I stop you pulling down, pull down, can you feel that? Yeah. That's tension. He is actively pulling against me, lifting him up. And he's trying to do that. That is different to him just doing that. 
okay? I want him to actively pull down, why? Because when you make this move here, you're gonna get shot to the tail and the ski tip's gonna fly forward. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends whether you're in control. Yes, depends if you've got ankle tension. It's a good thing because you're trying to get the skis to move away from you at the top of the turn, okay? If I can get, and somebody said in the gondola to me about getting early edge. At the top of the turn, I am already getting edge. That's going to be hell of a good thing. But how do I do that? Well, I've just told you. I do it through this retraction, which pings my skis back uphill and allows the skis to come round. As opposed to what you see on the video with you lot, you're here and your skis are there. I will look like this by this point in the turn. My skis will be up there. It's almost like they're going back up the mountain. That gets them on edge, okay? So this retraction thing, I'm hoping is going to be a one-stop fix it. It might not work for some of you, but for some of you, you're going to get a bit of a shock, especially if you don't have ankle tension, torque and tension in your muscles. You will get shot to the tail because it's going to be a different sensation. Don't be scared of different changes, okay? No. A byproduct basically means that as I'm going past the apex of the turn, this is the middle of the turn, and I'm coming to the end of the turn, and at the end of the turn, what tends to happen with skiers is they feel good because they're now going to cross the slope, so they're digging like this, they feel really good about it and hold it a bit too long, is at this point here, I want you to create a retraction here. This retraction, yes, heel heavy, this retraction will make the legs go underneath you, and go up this direction. They will actively follow the curve and they'll go out and back up. Because the way the force builds up underneath your feet, it'll make this, 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 the knees travel in this direction. You'll then catch yourself in a long position. And that's the up, but it's laterally up. It's not up that way like I seen you skied this morning. It's up that way. I am now tall. Okay? Yeah. If I go up in the air, I'm tall. This is what you're mistaking. You're thinking up means up. Never means this, okay? It means lateral. It's a bit of a, a bad cueing word. So this retraction is going to help, okay? Now, if you can see me, I would suggest you maybe put yourself in a position to see me, maybe you can see me do it, and that might help you understand the timing. And the byproduct part is the fact that if I retract, I will get pinged laterally up. Oh, the Okay, so he's missing a pole plant, which is really making it difficult for him to stay stable with such a thing. But it's interesting to see him do it. Ricky's starting now. Okay, well done, Oliver. I mean, that was good. That was good, but we need a pole plant to help stabilise you a bit, because it's a pole plant. Uh, yeah, you definitely pole plant. Okay. Okay, Rick, not so bad. Again, you'll find this not almost comfortable. You're quite tall. You've got a, the length of your, your tibia and your femur means that to sink down, it's going to be very, you know, more difficult, but also from a power perspective, you're going to feel it. Oh, this is not bad at all. Okay. Well done. Not bad at all. And this is Mike. This is good. So you can see with Mike, he was quite good at this for the very start as well. And he's definitely staying lower than some of you guys. There it is. There it was. Okay. Really good, Mike. I like the one where you got really caught back, where it shot forward on you. And now it's just a matter of controlling that, that feeling of getting shot and spat to the back. That was good, good demonstration of it.
Okay, good, well done, Will. Getting an idea that's much more active than you were this morning. Ah, this is good. That was nice. Oh, yes. <laughs> Compared with this morning, this is a bit different. Okay. Whoa. Yeah, well done. Super skiing. Very nice. Very nice. It's hot, yeah. You're right, actually, because, it, it, you know, different skis give different shapes, etc. as well. What I'm noticing from the girls here is really good that the skis are automatically turning and finishing the turn nicely. So when people say in skiing, finish the turn, actually, it's a bad thing to say because a lot of people try to turn their feet at the end of the turn. Whereas what I want them to do is actually finish the turn using the ski, using the shape of the ski. Everybody, especially um, here, especially the girls, really good demonstration girls from U3. Um, excellent. Uh, you were completely static and still. You had a really nice position in the pelvis. Um, and that's important. Um, Will, you did a good demo of the movement, but you've got a little bit of hip twisting in and out. Um, try to go down on the next thing, and I'm just going to give you a a cue rather than try and drill this into you and hold your hips or whatever. But go down this time and resist. When you start to go across the hill, there's gonna be a natural want for the hip to do that. To wanna to turn, the pelvis wants to do this, okay? Try to resist the pelvis from moving. Just in, in its essence, keep it still all the time and focus on using your um, psoas muscles, the muscles here in your stomach and the muscles here, adductor, abductors, to hold your pelvis from rolling as you make a long turn. And this is the problem with the power because as you sink down, the pelvis will want to do that. And you have to stop that from happening, okay? Anybody got any questions? It's really good. Really good. Now we're going to just ski it because we need to practice. We need to practice without information the lowness part. I already told you that when people pick things up off the floor, they have a tendency to hinge forward. This very common error that you see with skiers, particularly with snowboarders, because they don't want to use the ankle and knees as much. But if you watch a child pick something up, they will all into pick something up. So what happens as we get older, is we just get lazier or we find what we think are efficient ways to do things. I'm going to force you to be in a bit of an uncomfortable position here so you identify if you're using your knees and ankles properly. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to hold our torsos, the spinal area, caught sitting back, if you like, towards the end. The turn. I want you to go upright, chest up. Don't let your chest in here. Where So this rotation he has in his hip is something that I'll tackle later because you, you just can't do everything at once. And um, what he's doing is he's just following a bit too much and his, his pelvis isn't under control. Next one. But obviously the idea today is to, to demo what we were working on. Um, and as a coach, you've always got to focus on um, the things that they actually were being told to do, as opposed to introducing then something completely different. And what I'm interested in is observing if they've understood a little bit whoop, um, about how to be lower 
And from this point on, we need to explain then the why. Why do they need to be lower? And one of the reasons, obviously, is that they remain more connected. Um, this problem of skiers uh, making up and forward actions at the start of a turn, the cueing of that up and forward, needs to, we need to be very cautious of that. We need to be aware that, um, this is a good demo, that the up is, is often more lateral. It's more the skis moving away from the body as they're retracting and extending. That was a nice one. Um, very, very good. So that last one where you got caught was a really good one. It's now just learning how to control that power. So what you felt was the power from the ski there. And you just, you just got to be quicker at getting on top of it again. But that was the, the best one from them all. I know for you it was the worst, but for me it was the best because you demonstrated exactly what we wanted. It's definitely going to give a different sensation being in this lower position. The um, points, the byproducts of this, um, I've already picked up, by the way, on Will with his rotation as well, um, either off camera, on camera, I can't remember. But again, I'm careful not to go, go into a different uh, part of skiing at the minute. Uh, it needs to be tackled, it's obvious, but at the minute I'm just interested in how low he is. So yeah, so when he's lower and stacked in the way he is at the end of the turn with this retraction, it should give them the ability to, in the releasing part of the turn at the end, to get onto the new edges um, better and a higher edge angle than they're used to feeling at the top end of the turn. And that was one of the things which, you know, differs again, good skiers from um, expert skiers, as expert skiers have a high edge tilt above the fall line. They're not just waiting till the fall line to then lean the ski edges over and finish the... Oh, that's a good one. Again, well done, Mike. Um, so they're getting their skis um, much better um, onto their edges above the fall line, which is good. Ooh.